Hi, I'm Brian Mallow with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh. And this is an interesting year for an interesting insect, the cicada. Uh, and not just the regular annual cicada, but the 17-year cicada. It actually comes in a few varieties, and I don't know that much about it, but that's why I have a very special guest here to tell us about it. She is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Connecticut, and her name is Chris Simon. Chris, hello. Hi. Hi, so um, there is a variety of cicadas. There are 17 year, there's 13 year, and then there's the annual. Are there any other years represented by the cicada? Well, um, most cicadas are not synchronized, like periodical cicadas. So they have longer life cycles than one year, but they come out, you see them every year. However, there is a cicada in Northeast India, we've heard reports, it comes out at the year of the Soccer World Cup. So once every four years. It comes out for the World Cup. Yes. I knew soccer fans were fanatical, but that I'd never heard that one before. So um, maybe I should start by just asking you, uh, what is a cicada? A cicada is an insect that's in the um, order Hemiptera that feeds on uh, plant saps or xylem fluid from the plants. And uh, so they're plant sucking insects, more, more or less. And they have various relatives like spittle bugs and uh, tree hoppers, leaf hoppers. Those aren't the most well known. I happen to be a big fan of hoppers, leaf hoppers, mm -hmm. tree hoppers, plant hoppers, but uh, they're not that well known as far as uh, insects go. But uh, those are some of their closest relatives? Yes. Yes, and um, although they're not well known, a lot of people have seen the tree hoppers, for example, because they're famous for looking like thorns. Mm -hmm. And they're also famous for singing by substrate born vibrations. The hoppers, yes. yes. Uh, and now cicadas, people might know them by also the, the court. I grew up in Houston, Texas, and now mm -hmm. I'm living here in Raleigh. And you hear them in the summer, uh, just the, I guess, is it? all right to call them the annual cicadas, is that mm -hmm. what we refer to? Yep. Um, and they're just this synchronized singing that uh, builds up to like a crescendo and down, and it's like, it's part of summer mm -hmm. in the south, right. I guess. Uh, how do they make their sounds? They make their sounds using a membrane on the abdomen called the timbal. It's a ribbed membrane, and it's got two giant, one on either side, only in the males, and there's two large muscles attached to the timbal, and they cause them to vibrate very fast, which vibrates the air and makes the sound. Okay, so that, is that unusual? Because I know, what, isn't like crickets rub their legs together? Uh, creatures have a lot of mechanisms for, we have our vocal cords right. uh, that we pass air over. Uh, there are a lot of mechanisms for making sound. That sounds right. like an unusual one, or? Yeah, well, the, that whole order of insects, the uh, timbals occur in various groups in that order of insects. But uh, yeah, in orthoptera, like crickets, they rub their legs together or parts of their wing in their, their legs. There's a file and scraper. But some cicadas actually don't sing using timbals. Some cicadas actually bang the, the tree branches with their wings. Those are called wing bangers. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm tempted to sort of say, what's a nice girl like you studying uh, a crazy insect like this? How did you come to, uh, to, to become fascinated with cicadas? Did you uh, start out somewhere else? Did you work your way towards them? Mm -hmm. Well, I started out working on barnacles and I've, uh, as an undergraduate... That's, an unu that's unusual and it's, uh, what, what fascinated you about barnacles? I know that Charles Darwin also uh, was fascinated with them. Right. That's about all I know about them. Well, I wanted to study natural selection and I wanted to study, um, I, I was asking the question whether um, differences in salinity between high and low in the inner tidal would affect the genetics of the barnacles, whether you could see natural selection in operation. And we could see differences in their proteins between, cicada, uh, between barnacles high and low in the inner tidal. And while I was doing that, I discovered a species of barnacle on uh, alizyme gel in the laboratory. So just looking at a gel with bands in it, I saw there was a strange band. And I went back and looked at my barnacles in the field. And I saw there was this other species of barnacle that looked like my barnacle. But I just hadn't noticed it because they were so similar. But on the, in biochemically, they were very different. So I thought, well, I can use biochemistry to study differences between species. And so when I went to graduate school to do my PhD, I was interested in how 
species differ. And I thought if I wanted to understand how species formed, then the best thing to do would be to study very closely related species. And one example of that was the periodical cicadas, where you had these different species groups, and you had 13 and 17s, and you also had year classes that were reproductively isolated. Once you get reproductive isolation, you're on your way to forming species. Um, species is, is interesting. Do we, I, I, is this contentious, or do we still, how do we define a species? Mm -hmm. Does it have to do with whether they, whether they can interbreed or not? Mm -hmm. There's lots of different species um, uh, mechanisms and lots of different species concepts. And so your definition of species will depend on which concept you choose. And in general, in biology now, what, what we do is um, we study all the different species concepts to better understand what is a species because it, it is it is controversial where to draw the line sometimes between species. And so by understanding a different ways that you can conceive of what a species is, then that just helps you understand them better. So um, the biological species concept is based on whether things can reproduce. And that's one of the most common species concepts. And everybody understands the fact that if two things can interbreed, they're probably the same species. And if they can't, they're probably different species. Yeah. So um, this year, one of the broods of 17-year cicadas is coming out. Now, that actually had a lot of information in it that someone who's not familiar with these concepts might not understand. So maybe you could tell me what that means exactly. What are these 17-year cicadas, and what are these broods? Well, the 17-year cicadas are um, a group of three different morphologically distinct species that all come out together. And um, they come out once every 17 years, but the 17th year differs from place to place in the Eastern United States. And so for each year, we've given each year a number, and the number refers to that year. And so brood one came out last year in, in 2012, and brood two is coming out this year in 2013. And is there a brood every year? There's a brood almost every year. So for the next 10 years, there'll be a different every, broods of 17 years cicadas. And then there'll be um, two years where there aren't broods. So brood 11 is missing, although it used to occur in Connecticut. So that's what I was going to say. Do you think where there's missing ones, do you think there was a brood there? There was a brood for each year? Probably, but not, not definitely. We don't know for sure, but it's possible. Um, since most years have them. So they have this, uh, when they come out, uh, tell me what this emergence is like and, and tell me how it fits in with their life cycle. The emergence is very large. There'll be billions and billions of them in any one location. And so their strategy for survival is predator satiation, uh, safety in numbers. Yes. And they've, they're all, everything about their biology revolves around this strategy of safety in numbers. What do you mean? They're perfectly synchronized, so they all come out together within a couple of days of each other. So the emergence period will last about a week, with the peak will be two or three days with the biggest peaks. And so they'll all be out singing together, um, and they have this predator foolhardy behavior so they don't fly as readily as annual cicadas. They're very noticeable. They have bright colors. They have very shiny, reflective wings, different from other cicadas that so don't So what would reflect. that, what's the significance of that in terms of? It just makes them a lot more obvious to Okay, predators. they're very obvious. Who are their predators? Their predators are birds. Any birds that eat insects will eat periodical cicadas, but also things like box turtles, snakes, raccoons, possums, cats, dogs, people. Everybody eats cicadas. So this is what you're calling predator, uh, predatory foolhardy behavior? Or they're predator, predator foolhardy? They're foolhardy because they don't fly away readily. They're easy to catch. They're not, just, they're not camouflaged. They're shiny and attractive. They're obvious. They have bright red eyes. Yes. And, um, and then they don't run away. Yeah, if you've ever tried to catch an annual cicada, you know it's very difficult. You get close to them and they take off. These periodical cicadas, yeah, they don't notice you. So, and... You think that's just because um, they don't need to because there are billions of them? Yes. Yes. It's we a, can lose a few. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's not good for the individual, but it works for the species. 
Well, no, each individual has a better chance of surviving if it comes out in the big mass. It's definitely for the benefit of the individual. Okay, so it can pass on its unique genetic code. Right. Uh, how could that even come to be? So they, they, don't, they don't only exist in that period. There's, for 17 years, they live underground. Yes, yes, um, That seems like a crazy long time, especially for the lifespan of an insect. Yeah, it is the longest time from egg to adult for uh, continuously growing insects, not accounting, there's a few species that can diapause or go into resting stages um, and then come out years later, but it's not, it's not um, growing the whole time. So the these ground. are continue, they go actually go through some phases underground. Yes, they go through five stages underground. Each time they shed their skin and become larger. Until finally, and what could even control, that seems like a, a fascinating, uh, subject right there about what can control this timing of coming out every 17 years and why 17? Yes, well we think that they, they have to have an, uh, a molecular counter of some sort. They're counting the years. So they, they're feeding on tree roots. It's easy for them to know when a year passes because they can monitor changes in the tree. So when the leaves flush out in the spring, the tree will change and okay. they're feeding on that. But how could um, they keep track of 17 years? Right, they have to have some kind of molecular counter. And so they're counting off the years. But that's not known at this time? No, we don't know it, but we're doing uh, genome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing right now. And we're trying to find uh, genes associated with the life cycle. And then there are other cicadas that are very closely related, but that are 13 year cicadas. Right. Is there any other difference between them besides the, the amount of years, the, the, their periodicity? No, they, in the 13 year skatas, there's also the same three species groups. Um, we've named them differently. So Magiscata tridecim in the 13 year would be Magiscata septendecim in the 17. And then there's Magiscata tridecasini and Magiscata cassini. It doesn't have a septen in front of the name because it was named a long time ago before we knew about the third species, Magiscata tridecula and Magiscata septendecula. How long have you been studying these? I've been studying them since I was a student back in 1974. That's quite a long time. How yeah. many factors of 17 is that? Uh, um. <laughs> I've seen several broods two or three times. How many multiples, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, and the reason you're actually here, so you're, you're a professor in Connecticut, and the reason that you're in North Carolina right now is because this is this magic time of the year and Brood 2 right. is popping out. So how widespread is this? And are, are these 17 and 13 year cicadas all over the world? No, only in the United States, east of the Great Plains. Really? This is only an American thing? Right. Well, how, what do you make of that? Is that, what's, how does that come to be? Well, we don't, we don't know exactly, but we think that these things just by chance got trapped into this periodical life cycle. And as they became more sy synchronous, then selection became stronger for them to be synchronous. So there was a feedback loop where they evolved this longer synchronized life cycle. And as in order to become synchronous, they had to extend their life cycle even longer because the nymphs are growing at different rates underground because some are stronger than others, some get better feeding sites than others. So they're growing at different rates. And so the ones that get to the fifth instar or last instar first have to wait for the others to catch up. So natural selection has favored the lengthening of the life cycle so that by the time the cicadas come up, there's a lot of them ready to come up together. Safety in numbers. Right. Uh, and cicadas are around the world, but just not these periodical Right. Ones. There's about 3,000 species of cicadas in the world. Not all of them are described yet. Okay. There's lots of biodiversity out there waiting to be discovered. Do you, speaking of numbers, do you have a, uh, an idea of what the, how large a population of scientists are studying cicadas? Yes, I mean, I know all of them. <laughs> so it can't be too many, them, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'd have to count my, my list, but there's probably about 30, something like that, 30 or 40. Wow, that's not very many. No, no, but this is just a very small group of insects, only 3,000 species. Most insects, there's a lot more. Yeah. And a, that's a family of insects. So I do know, and, uh, and one of our, uh, one of uh, 
our colleagues, uh, Holly Menninger with the Dunn Lab, with Rob Dunn's lab, was very interested in your use of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, since there are only some 30 of you studying these, um, citizen scientists uh, can be very helpful in gathering data. So how have you incorporated citizen science and social media into your studies? Well, um, one of my colleagues, Dr. John Cooley, has built a website called magiscicada.org, and it's linked closely to our general cicada website called Cicada Central. And at magiscicada.org, there are um, forms for reporting cicada sightings, and then um, when he gets reports, he uh, well, they automatically get put on to Google Maps, and there's an, a map there that you can zoom in on, and you can see where the cicadas have been reported. It, record, it records the most recent 500 reports. And so some of the reports for North Carolina have fallen off the map already. Um, but as we get reports, they get reported, and that helps us make distributions. And so what we do is we go to places where people have reported, and we try to get the edges. We we'll try to carefully map the edges of each brood to see where it comes in contact with other broods. And so knowing where the general pattern of emergence is helps us find the edges, and it also has helped us to find unusual, weird populations that we didn't know about. And why is that important, that finding the edges? Um, just what mysteries are you actually trying to solve? We're trying to figure out how the different broods form. And we know, for example, that the cicadas can come out four years early, four years late, occasionally one year early or one year late. But it's very common for them to come out four years early, less common four years late, but we've seen that as well. And if you come out four years early as a 17-year cicada, then you come out as a 13-year cicada because the difference between 17 and 13 is four years. And we can also see 13-year so cicadas sometimes come out four years late as 17-year cicadas, or 13-year cicadas, some, some records of them coming out four years early as 9-year cicadas. Okay, so what's the one question you most want the answer to? Well, we would like to know the genetic mechanism for the change in the life cycle but for these four-year jumps, and we also want to know how they count the years. And so that's one of the reasons that we're doing transcriptome sequencing now, for trying to sequence the, um, the transcribed genes in the, all of them in the cicadas. And if people are interested in participating as citizen scientists, how can they help? Well, they can go to magiscada.org and report their sightings, especially if you, they see these stragglers coming out in odd years. And so there's a place on the website where you can report them. Also, any fact that they want to know about periodical cicadas is on that website. So there's a lot of different links, and you can find out about broods and species and Audio anything. files of the different yeah, songs. Yeah, frequently asked questions. Yeah, audio files, pictures. Excellent. And so when you leave here, where are you headed uh, next to, uh, to, to explore this emergence? Uh, we're going back to the Greensboro area, and um, we're mapping out west. There was a weird population of 13-year cicadas in Moxville in, 19, in 2011. And so we're going to go out and see whether how close does Brood 2 come to that weird population in Moxville. We're going to be going down the Yadkin River Valley. Brood 2 comes down the Yadkin River Valley, and 13-year Brood 19 goes up the Yadkin River Valley. We want to know, do they touch? Excellent. Well, good luck, and Thanks. thank you very much. And if people want more information, the website, again, is uh, magiscicada.org, with lots of information there and how you can help. And um, I've been speaking with Chris Simon from the University of Connecticut. I'm Brian Mallow at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences.